Decker Halls with Bowels of Gory. Fa la 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 la. Tis the season to be scary. Fa la 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 la. Don we now our fright apparel. Fa la 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 la. Troll the ancient zombie carol. Fa la 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 la. See the blazing skull hanging here. Fa la 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 la. Swing the axe and join the corpses. Fa la 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 la. Uh. Whoa. What? That got worrisome. Nah, it's fine. It's just a Halloween Carol. Hmm. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Halloween episode of B Movie Anima the Series. I'm Jeff Arbuckle, your Commander Riker, for this trek through a spooky movie to celebrate the best time of the year. With me, as always, is Nurse Disembody, delectably dressed in her Counselor Troy garb to help celebrate the season. Probably not my choice of outfits for Halloween, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, you enjoy getting a paycheck too, so... Let's say you really went all out for decorating your side of the office. I mean, you really only had to dress the part. You didn't have to recreate the bridge of the Enterprise D. I do nothing half-assed. Ah, I suppose not. Uh, anyway, this week's episode of B-Movie Anima takes a look at 1988's Hollow Gate. Now check out this cover, kiddos. I mean, how delightfully Halloween of it all. You've got a spooky house way back there in the background. There's a spooky gate, spooky trees. You have a very key component of any Halloween, a jack-o'-lantern just chilling over there with a bloody knife sticking out of it. And you have all that text all over the place. And doesn't this just get you in the mood for the most wonderful time of the year, nurse? Oh yes, I can practically hear the wind howling through the spooky scene right now. Oh, I wish we were watching the howling instead. Oh no, why, is this a bad movie? Uh, I mean, well, I mean, the howling is awesome, but Hollowgate is no howling. True, but you work with what the poop shoot gives you. Well, ain't that the truth. Anyway, Hollowgate is one of those late 80s video store treats that were just puked out into every hole in the wall store and mega chain blockbuster types every year. Low budget, practically no one in it. And uh, one of those titles that comes out, catches people's attention for a single day or time of year and is quickly forgotten. Relegated to collecting dust in the genre section and you know, maybe playing some cable channels. Now, I assume this movie was made by City Lights Entertainment Group, or at least was distributed by it, or partially funded by that group, I don't know. But City Lights seemed to kind of excel at the 80s exploitation stuff. I mentioned that Hollowgate was probably shot out in the video stores in October of 1988 to capitalize on the Halloween of it all. Well, City Lights almost exclusively released horror, action, and thriller movies. And this is prime stuff for that era of the video store. They made what rented. Now, let's talk a little bit about this later, but City Lights Entertainment Group's movies did feature some crossover of talent. Most of their movies were directed by a guy by the name of Joseph Mary or something of that nature. So it probably really was much more of a homegrown kind of movie making company. Now, Hollowgate is the sole film from director Ray DeZazzo. And I mean it, he made nothing else. Most of the people in this movie have only one credit, and that is Hollow Gate. Uh, some did more, and one guy in particular I recognized very clearly, and another I recognized after I realized who he was. Uh, but this is a very small and intimate production. Now, Nurse, I think uh, we're going to get things going here on our very first Halloween-centric episode of B-Movie Enema the Series. What you think? Sounds like a wonderful idea, Jeff, but... Well, what's the matter? The, well, this is a pretty short movie. It's less than an uh, hour and a half. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So City Lights made no movie over 94 minutes in length, with this one only coming in at about 84 or so. So, uh, I mean, what do you think, Nurse? What do you think we should do? Should we, I don't know, do something with these Star Trek costumes? Like, do a thing where we're attacked by Klingons or Romulans or something? Like, ooh, uh, what about the Borg? They're, they're scary. Nah. No? Well, then why why are we wearing these costumes? I mean, it's Halloween. Are you sure you don't want to do something Star Trek related for this episode? I've, I've put a lot of work into making this thing look all Star Trek-y over here. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Why? 
I, that, that's really hard to write, and the editing involved is probably outside my capabilities. Plus, lots of Trek stuff is probably copyrighted out the ass, and it seems like a real pain in the butt, if you ask me. <sighs> I mean, besides, this is a culmination of a long game I was kind of playing. You see, last season, I had no beer. This season, I do. Uh, in the beginning of Star Trek Next Generation, Commander Riker didn't have a beard. Then the second season came along, and suddenly, bam, beard. Oh my god, nerd! Yep, anyway, I guess we can show a Halloween cartoon to help us uh, celebrate the best of all holidays? Ooh, yeah, that sounds fun. Yeah, it sure does. So, uh, okay folks, we're going to get things started with 1937 Skeleton's Frolic uh, before we dive right into Hollow Gate. <laughs> so as this movie begins, something becomes very clear to me. Mark's dad is a drunk and abusive? Oh, for sure. But that's not what I was going for. In a post-COVID-19 world, bobbing for apples seems like a real bad idea? Oh god, yeah. But uh, that's how we rolled in the 80s. And you swap your viruses and diseases and you basically come out the other end invincible. Yuck. No, what I was getting at uh, is this was either shot on video, uh, TV production cameras, or some sort of film stock that was mostly used for instructional and or religious scare films. Uh, the movie does not look very good, but let's talk about our movie, yes? So Mark's dad has some sort of inferiority complex for his son not being as good at bobbing for apples as girls. I mean, I guess he thinks he's like all limp-wristed and weak. For not being good at bobbing for apples? Well, I mean, yeah, that's the other thing in the 80s. Kids swap their shit and prove their manliness in the bobbing for apples bucket. I have to wonder how you ever survived the decade. By having big dick apple bobbing energy, duh. Anywho, uh, Mark has a shitty home life as a kid and isn't doing much better as we go 10 years later as he is still the target for bullying by men who can clearly bob for apples better than he can. This Lothario and his girlfriend goes to the gas station Mark works at and decides to fuck with Mark a bit. Hey, that reminds me. Nurse, uh, remember that one time we gave your panties to the dork at the gas station? Yeah, he used them to shove in the gas tank and blew up our car. He sure did. With us inside! Eh. Now, Mark is played by uh, Addison Randall. Randall had a couple of dozen acting credits, and he didn't entirely work in these types of uh, really low-budget productions, either. Uh, he was in movies like Force 5 and They Call Me Bruce in the early 80s before uh, getting the lead in Hollow Gate. And this kind of makes me wonder if he was some sort of a kung fu kind of guy or what. Uh, but he ended up directing a handful of movies, too, one of which was a movie called Payback, also known as Revenge. Now, Revenge featured a couple of guys from this movie, too, Ted Buck and Jeffrey Culver. Culver is recognizable to me for one very important movie in my life. Culver, who plays the judge in the trial for Mark after he's arrested for harassing a girl, was the old man in the wonderfully stupid Gremlin slash Critters ripoff Hobgoblins. Hobgoblins, for as bad as it is, is relatively fun and made for one of the best episodes of Mystery Science Theater 3000 ever. Seriously, go online. You'll find that episode streaming everywhere. Watch it. It's fantastic. But I digress. Randall also appeared in a movie called Emperor of the Bronx with a couple of other actors in this movie too, Charlie Gannis and Elizabeth Toomey, uh, the two who bullied Mark at the gas station and got blowed up real good. Now, Randall would go on to uh, write some screenplays too. The last screenplay he wrote was LA Wars, which was one of uh, Vinegar Syndrome's recent archive releases and has been featured on Red Letter Media's Best of the Worst just earlier this year. Honestly, Addison had a fairly decent little career. Um, he's not acted in anything since 1997, so I'm not sure if he retired from acting to do something else, but I do know he spent the last 10 years as an assistant director and production manager. He seems perfectly creepy in this movie. Yeah, you can see this as a little bit of a psycho-style movie. Uh, Mark clearly has some parental issues. It's stated in the first segment that uh, his parents have both died and he's staying with his grandma now. And we saw earlier when he was little that he wanted to live with grandma and tell dad to go fuck off in a big bucket of apple bobbing backwash. That scene when he's talking to grandma through the speaker is a little unsettling. 
Yeah, to avoid jail for being a creep to that girl he liked, uh, he was handed over to his grandma and given some drugs and therapy that seems to be making him more of a creep. But clearly his unresolved issues from childhood are ratcheting up his Norman Bates style personality. Now let's get back to the movie and... J Jeff, we're picking up on something on long range sensors. Uh, something large. Uh, now, nurse, I told you, we're, we're only dressed up in Star Trek clothes for Halloween. It's too expensive or time consuming or I'm too lazy to take this any further. And wait, and besides, the clinic has no sensors. This, this is a building, not a spaceship. But Jeff, I'm not kidding. Something is approaching. Now, let's get back to the movie and we'll sort this uh, thing out and if it's going to be a thing or we're just going to drop it. Clearly, Nurse Disembody here is really trying hard to make this a thing. Now, Nurse, if you're going to insist on this role play, I'm going to need you to refer to me as number two. Okay, Counselor Disembody, keep me informed if it continues to close in on our position. Yes, sir. Number two. Uh, do I really have to call you that? Yes, if you're going to force me to play Star Trek, you have to call me that. Aye aye, Captain. Now, now you see, this is where you get it all wrong here. I'm only wearing three pips here on my uniform. That means I'm a commander, not a captain. Oh, so, oh, jeez. So, um, Mark's dear sweet grandma wants to uh, get him back to doing normal things. Halloween is coming up, so she does what any good doting grandma will do. Suggest they throw a little party. Have a few people over. Have some Halloween fun times, you know? Yep, fun times. Except, Mark's not taking his brain meds. Uh-oh. Yep, it would seem that Halloween is a bit of a trigger for old Marky Mark, and he doesn't want the funky bunch around, so he decides to kill his sweet grandma with a pair of scissors. Now, this sets up our second act. Uh, we meet our four young partiers who are headed to a party in Oklahoma at an airplane hangar. Why things are so damn specific is beyond me. Well, obviously we had to know they are underage and therefore must go to Oklahoma to be able to drink under the age of 21. And that they have to have money to go to this party at the hangar that they don't even have enough for, so they need to be given a reason to deliver this guy's stuff to Hollow Gate. Uh, yeah. So, by the way, this is something that sometimes comes up in old TV shows and movies. Not every state had the same drinking ages. Before 1987, some states had the more common 21-year-old drinking age. A few had 20, many had 19 or 18, and 21, depending on the beverage. And a very, very few had 18 set as the drinking age for all forms of alcohol. 1984 was when the National Drinking Age Act was passed. Then it was adopted by the states, but here was the catch. States had to raise the purchase and possession age to 21 by October of 1986 or risk losing infrastructure funds from the federal government. South Dakota and Wyoming were the last two states to change the minimum age and that was in mid-1988. Some debates have been had for states to lower the drinking age again, uh, but it hasn't really gone anywhere. A few states do have exceptions in some religious situations or types of drinks. The United States, great for some liberties, but behind the world and so many others, particularly the fun ones. But hey, the reason why I went down that rabbit hole is because in 1988, when this movie was made and released, Oklahoma had already raised the age of consumption to 21. They did all that uh, full year before the act passed Congress. So, sheesh movie, it really messed up there, didn't you? Well, at least the movie has Halloween atmosphere for days. Oh, it sure does. I mean, these four kids decide to stop off at a diner to get some burgers and beers. They catch the sight of a costume shop, so they decide to go over there. One girl in particular really wanted this pink Rick James wig. Oh my gosh, she did. She didn't care that her boyfriend was almost out of money and they weren't going to get drunk at the hangar party. She had to have that wig. <laughs> yep, but she's able to obtain the wig as the costume store owner asks the quartet to make a delivery for him at Hollow Gate. Uh, the kids agree because the girl will get the wig and they're going to an estate where they assume rich people will be hanging out. Yeah, I'm not too sure what they thought the cool part about being around rich people would do for them. I mean, yeah, they kind of lost the thread there, didn't they? But it's all good. It gets us to our slasher part of the movie. 
Oh yes, finally. So Mark uh, puts this elaborate ruse together for some reason. What did he intend to do? He was clearly wanting to set up a scenario in which he would have costumes to dress up in. If someone delivered the costumes, then he'd have someone to kill. Oof. This seems like a real long way to go to set all this shit up. But maybe he only wanted the costumes. The kids to kill are bonuses. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I kind of feel like, you know, they had to have a movie, so they just arranged for there to be victims. And I will say that it would also seem highly unlikely that no one else in town would know Mark's story and maybe not deliver to the estate in the off chance that he snapped, stabbed his granny in the eyeball, and strung her up with fake spider webbing. The local cops even know he's a little crazy, so I kind of think that no one would deliver out there. Ooh, maybe the costume store man is in on it with Mark. You know, that sounds just as good of a way to keep this movie rolling as any. Still, this movie, with all the Halloween atmosphere, well, it has some good faith credit. This isn't the best movie or the most exciting, but I kind of have to say that I kind of like it. It's a little like Most Dangerous Game, but on Halloween. The four kids are trapped on the grounds of Hollowgate, and Mark is getting dressed up and hunting them down. Now, the guys aren't without some good ideas. Realizing the fence is electrified, they decided to go find something that might help them dig their way out under the gate and fence. Uh, so the guy we think would be most capable, Billy, goes and leaves the girls behind with Dorky Allen. Mark is dressed as an incredibly racist Vietnam War army guy and kills Billy. And so we find ourselves in a particularly harrowing situation in which... Jeff, I, I mean number two. What is it? The scanners show that object is still heading towards us and picking up on speed. Eep. Well, maybe we should get back to the movie while we monitor this situation with the starship sensors our clinic suddenly sprouted. And so concludes Hollow Gate. This segment started off the cops going to the diner and talking with the owner, who is our most recognizable actor in the movie, Biff Yeager, plays the diner owner and he's had a fairly long career. In fact, he's still working. Uh, Jaeger would be best recognized as Tom from Gilmore Girls, having been on several episodes and one of the episodes of the sequel series that streamed a few years back. Now, how'd you like that whole monologue there by the character Mandy who was weeping over Billy dying? That sure was bringing some serious Oscar clip energy. I'm a little busy right now with the ship positioning to attack us. What? What ship? The one that's been closing in on us? It's here. It appears to be aiming up to fire at us. Oh, come on. I mean, it was cute for a little while, but now I'm not so sure I want to play anymore. I think we should be closing down the episode. Oh, no. This is very real. Don't you see the ship on the screen? Uh... Look, this thing showed up all of a sudden, chased us down, and it's here now. Oh, come on. That's just a picture of a board cube. No, this is real. Just, just keep doing what you're doing. We'll, we'll deal with this. Yeah, whatever. Anyway... Did anyone notice that Alan was walking pretty good for a guy who took a shotgun blast to the leg? Uh, Mandy gets plowed, literally. Uh, Kim and Alan try to escape in a golf cart, the fastest of all getaway vehicles. Mark unleashes the dogs on them. Now, now normally when you unleash the dogs, they are ravenous pit bulls or Dobermans or something. Well, Mark doesn't have Dobermans or pit bulls, he has golden retrievers. <laughs> yeah, the sweetest of all big dogs. They jump on Alan and, I don't know, probably, like, basically love him to death. Uh, but this leaves Kim as the one and only survivor left. And uh, she's basically the least capable of surviving a movie of this kind. Uh, however, in the final few minutes, she figures it out and uh, throws ammonia in Mark's face and then stabs him with a butcher knife. Just then, the cops show up and check out what might be going on after they learn the costume store man sent four kids up to old hollow gate for a delivery. Now, nurse, you doing okay over there? Our shields aren't going to be able to stand up to too much of an assault from that thing. They're trying to lock a tractor beam onto us. Eh. Anyway, so yeah, the cops figure out how to get past the electrified fence instantly. They go in and blow Mark away. The next morning, an ambulance comes and takes Kim to the hospital, and the movie ends with uh, Kim maybe possibly in a mental hospital dealing with some heavy shit 
and seeing the ghost of Mark, but it also seems as though Mark survived two bullets to the head, too. Eh, whatever, I'm sure this will play out in Hollowgate 2, The Revenge of Kim, coming never to a theater near you. Uh, Nurse, do you think you can tell people where the good stuff can be found? I... can this wait? They're hailing us. Oh, come on, that was just a picture of a board cube. Don't you think you've taken this far enough? No, this is serious and real. I think we need to... Open hailing frequencies! <laughs> Woo! What up, party people? What in the... Oh, for... So, like, we're the Borg and stuff. Lower your shields. Prepare to be assimilated. Into this sweet-ass Halloween party over here. Woo! Woo! Uh, but we have an office party thing going on over here. Do you... Don't do it. Like, I don't know, want to come over here to this party? Ugh. Uh, well, like, we've never been actually invited to some place before. We'll talk this over, you know, <laughs> do some calculations. One moment. Who the fuck is that? Tell him what to do. I don't know how to do this guy, guy though. I don't even oh, know. I don't life. know. I bet he doesn't even know how to party. Guy, is he even a real doctor? Guys, remember the Some Pomo looks great. I think you're right. I don't think he's a real doctor. doctor. Is he talking to the board? Do you know where the board Yo, dude! We're still patched in with them! Turn off the hailing frequencies! Let me see your nurse's tits! Uh, see, they don't seem so bad. Jeff, once they start partying, they don't stop. They'll- I don't know why. I just think you should get really fucked up. Seriously, I don't care if she's a cartoon. I want to see them titties. Yeah, yeah, mm, yeah. So here's the deal, bro. Cheese. We uh, what was I gonna say to them? Tell them we offer them a trade. Oh, yeah. So anyway, here's the deal. Oh, just do it. Do it. <laughs> Hey, what's happening? What's going on? Huh, that's weird. Anyway, you can find all my B Movie Anima stuff at www.bmovieanima.com. New articles will appear there every Friday. And I've got nearly 300 text reviews over there for you to check out. Uh, you can also follow B Movie Enema on Facebook and Twitter. That's where you can stay up to date on all the articles that get released and catch up on the ones from the past. And hey, also subscribe to the B Movie Enema YouTube channel. There you can see episodes of this show, B Movie Enema the series, and also check out clips from movies that I've used in the text articles. And do you have a Roku? Well, add the free channel Other Worlds TV and check out B Movie Enema there uh, late night on Saturdays. Then, through the week, you can also see a lot of obscure and almost forgotten movies, as well as see the other horror hosts that play there on Saturdays and Sundays. Alright, so, Nurse, um, Nurse? Huh, where'd she go? Hey, what's this? Whoa! We are the Borg. Resistance is futile. From this point forward, you will party with us! <laughs> Woo bitches! Oh, yeah! I'm drunk, you guys! Yeah, come oh, over! Oh, Woo! Yeah! Oh, I wanna see oh, yeah! Woo! Yeah! Comic party! Woo! Like, hi, Jeff! Woo! God bless this house! I think we should just take him over. Mr. Borf, get the Doritos.